Hey, hey, hi, welcome back to Trek Chat, a podcast brought to you by Trick on the Tube. I am your usual host, Sean, and today is a very special day for me because I am joined by two very special guests, and they don't know it yet, or maybe they do, but I don't think so. They are my favorite YouTube Trekkies. I absolutely adore their content, and I refer to their channels when I go on vacation. I tell all my subscribers to go over there, and then they don't come back to my channel, they stay with you guys. <laughs> That's what happens. Um, Kit Wolski, how you doing? I'm great. I'm doing fantastic. How how are you doing? I'm I'm doing good. I'm very happy that you've uh, taken the time to come on. And uh, Kurt Rats, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great as well. Uh, weathering the stuff that we're going through as a world, and really happy that you invited me on. Awesome. Um, the topic today is pretty simple: Star Trek villains. Uh, the good ones, the bad ones, the ones we enjoy, the ones we dislike. And also, is there a need for them? Because I feel like some of the best Star Trek movies don't necessarily have Star Trek villains. I'm, I'm referring to Star Trek Four. I, I got that. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think yeah. everyone did. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's that's the topic. That's uh, that's what we're talking about. Just, you know, general discussion. We can go in any direction uh, you guys want. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have, like, a favorite villain that you want to start off with or something? Maybe uh, Kurtrats? Well, actually, I, I, I kind of have a bit of a left field choice because on my channel on Fridays, we do these uh, live reviews of episodes every once in a while. And recently we did Year of Hell. Uh, so I was kind of focusing on Anorax a little bit as far as a villain that I hadn't thought of in ages. But when you watch those episodes, he's a really complex, well thought out villain. And I think he's a, an example of a good Star Trek villain. Not my favorite. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about a bunch of others, but I, I just I wanted to note that one because I think he's pretty cool. Absolutely, I think that two part is just amazing. Mm -hmm. So I I would say I I have like a weird answer. Um, well, well <laughs> I, it's 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 a it's a uh, it's it's the crystalline entity is my answer. Um, even Ooh. though it, uh. and the reason I say that is because it's it's originally played. Um, as a straight kind of villain character, um, I think kind of in its first or so-ish appearance. But later on, um, when they actually attempt to communicate with it, there's almost like an underlying um, misunderstanding between what the crystalline entity is doing and and how human beings um, are perceiving what it's doing. And it was kind of an interesting kind of like twist, I thought, even though we didn't really get to explore it because obviously it got blowed up. But I thought it was very interesting, and I like how it was originally just painted as, like, this villain character that hung out with lore and was up to no good and just, you know, kind of, like, maybe was kind of a bad character. But we assumed that just because of its association with lore. But then later on, it was kind of like, maybe there's more here. Maybe there's going to be something else here. But we didn't get to explore that. But, yeah, so it's kind of a weird answer. But that, that was one of the ones that kind of came to mind that was a little out of the box. I feel like there's two crystalline entities, though. I and mean, there's two appearances, but are they two different ones or just one? As far as we know in the show, it was just the same one. Now, if you go into Star Trek Online, it's a whole other thing. But in the show, it was... It was... Uh, do they have, like, a whole species or something? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they have, like, a species, but they have, like, the crystalline entity, like, event and stuff like that where it's back again. So I think it's the implication is that there's more than one. So, but, yeah, that's that's all. Mm video game beta canon stuff but just from the shows yeah we basically there was the one and then we just blew it up it got blown up by that lady whose name i forgot uh dr kyla oh, Mar. oh yeah I, I think so i have no idea why i remember that is that, very but. weird you're much more connected <laughs> to the crystal identity than i am yeah. okay <laughs> oh no they That's know too right. much <laughs> yeah so that was that was because there's a lot of obvious answers right you know con krug you know uh, mm. there's a lot of very obvious the borg in general there's some obvious answers but i was thinking kind of like um kind of like what you said at the beginning um dan which is like is something a little off the beaten path and that was one of the ones that kind of came to mind for sure so you guys don't think of buck when we speak star trek villains <laughs> um not in a not in any way no <laughs> not in a positive or negative light does that does that work? I don't know if that works. <laughs> That's that echoes my feelings on that as well. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of like you guys. I don't have like um, an established favorite Star Trek villains, but some of them really stand out to me. 
and as strange as it is, Ruafo from the movie mm. that not not everyone enjoys. Um, I don't know. I, there was something about him when I was a kid, and I used to watch Star Trek with my with my mom. There was this thing about this guy getting his his skin pulled back, and when he gets angry, it, it pops, and there's the blood. Um, and the whole re- relationship, um, you know, these guys are the descendants or the children of from the, buck, the, of the, buck the people cool. living on the yeah. planet. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I don't know. I, I enjoyed that that whole dynamic. I know he's not the most popular villain, and it's not the most popular movie, but um, I think of him often when I think of villains in Star Trek. Well, I, and yeah. of course, Admiral Dowdy, because you know he's the classic bad admiral or admiral turned bad. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yo, I mean, F. F. Murray Abraham is just an amazing actor too. I, I still sometimes can't believe that he was cast in that role. Like it feels like a waste of that actor but at the same time the what he brought to that role i thought was fantastic help you out there it, for what it was on the page feel like a waste it was a waste because that was a pretty weak yes. script they gave him but <laughs> there was a lot more there he was like yeah they did not uh, make his character um have as much of an impact on the story he just seemed to be exposition man in every scene he was in um and then and then they just stretched his face to death on that flat iron well, he's very much sick into Admiral Doughty, isn't he? The Admiral's the, the big villain mm-hmm. in that movie, I guess. That's true. Well, yeah. the Sona, I think not even just Rafa, I think the Sona race, I think is very interesting to uh, pick up on is because of their relationship to the, the, the Bakul and the planet with the rings on it, but also what they were doing. And they're kind of an unsavory race. But there was a lot there, I thought, kind of like the the end there where like the his like second in command met up with his family again on the planet they kind of did like a quick shot of that which i thought was kind of interesting i wish they kind of explored a little bit more of those themes more between the the two races and and maybe they could have talked a little bit about you know some of the directives of the federation getting involved in familial disputes essentially but or we could just blow up rafo on the collector but that's yeah whatever (laughs) yeah Yeah, it's, it's a good movie. We're getting too old for this. It's, yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Anyways. Okay, so th- these are specific villains that we've seen um, kind of now and then in, in, in Star Trek. What do you guys think of the big... Because there seems to be a trend in modern Star Trek now, um, as I think multiple online have kind of addressed this, uh, where we have like these world-ending en- entities. Uh, what it was Synthulu, as people are calling it from Star Trek Picard, that kind of the, stuff. The synthipede, um, as I control. call it. Yeah. Oh, the synthipede. Yeah. <laughs> what do you What do you guys think of that? What do you guys think of this big uh, universe-ending or world-ending kind of villain? Yeah, I'm. I'm not gonna lie. I. I get. It's the one aspect of kind of the newer stuff that I get a little tired of, and you know, it, it kind of started. You know, in every movie, Earth has to be you know in peril and then now it's the galaxy and then it's the universe and it just it's kind of i don't know if you guys ever watched the television show 24 but it was like the first season there was a there was one character who you know was supposed to be assassinated and the whole season is them preventing that and then every season there's like after that there's like a world ending plague nukes uh something else really big and it's just like i miss that first season where the stakes were so low and so the same in star trek you know the universe does not have to be under existential threat with every show every movie that comes along i i it gets very tiresome so (laughs) as taking like i look at it from like two perspectives right Like, like looking at it from two different angles the actual entities and the beings that we're talking about the synthopede and control i think are really cool ideas and i think that those are cool villains especially the synthopede which we know nothing about like i thought was very smart to essentially create this big mystery around this thing and then not really resolve it and it's kind of like well there's just some kind of crazy synthopede out there doing something it's kind of interesting i think those are cool I, I agree with what you're saying that it is exhausting now that we're three seasons into the new versions of Star Trek and every single season is tied into this. If we don't do this, then the entire universe is going to die. And it's like, uh, and the 24 analogy is great. Another one that I would 
and I've talked about this with several people, like even even my wife, I've talked about this is why I don't like certain shows, like like a show like Grey's Anatomy, for instance, is another show. Like I don't really watch it, but it's another one of those shows. Even House, you know, it's like another one of those shows where it's like these are ordinary people, and every season they're going through like life changing, so extraordinarily out there events. And I get it, it's a drama and it's played up for that, but it gets to the point for me where it's like this is eight seasons of this, and it's like how. Like, how are these people still like, yeah, I guess I'll just go back to being a doctor and go back to the DMV after I was just shot for the 30th time in this television show. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, this is kind of like, it's not believable anymore. It gets, and 24 is a great example of that. It's just how many times is Jack Bauer going to suddenly save the day at the last possible second from this nuke right. from Mars that's going to like, you know what I mean? Like, what is he going to do? I don't know. And then he figures it out in the last five minutes and. Yeah, it just it, it is exhausting though, and I think they need to be careful moving forward. But honestly, it, and I'm not trying to sound negative, it doesn't seem like they're going to move away from that. I feel like every season now is going to have a similar universe-ending problem, at least for Discovery. They may do something with Picard, and from what we hear, Strange New Worlds may be something entirely different, where it's not going to be like that. Apparently, it's going to be much more um, episode to episode, much more episodic. So they may not have that problem, but. For discovery, it seems like they're going to stick with that. Yeah. yeah, you kind of feel disconnected from, like the the it's so big, it's so grandiose that ultimately you don't you don't feel too connected to the villain. Whereas if it's if it's a smaller thing going on, like the Patlids, right? You relate to Geordie's jo- struggle on the Patlid ship. Well, I I would go <laughs> right. Am I am I the, am I the only one? You're the only one that relates to, 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 to that. Yeah. On the I mean, Patlid. I was just going to roll right past it, but that's you know it's. <laughs> yeah no I, I i totally get what you're saying i want to throw something out there that you guys may be upset about but one of the characters villains that i liked from picard was bejazel even though she died as yeah, spoilers uh, hmm. but it, i liked that character because there was a there was a deliberate attempt to establish who this character was and there was connections to what was going on within the universe that they were building at that time and and with seven of nine and some of the other characters and stuff like that so it seemed like there was something there i really wish they hadn't killed her off because there was probably more to explore there but that was a really great kind of like contained villain that didn't impact the universe it was somebody doing something really wrong very illegal on this weird you know canto bite friggin casino planet and it was like it was like okay this is kind of interesting like these are some real under under seedy underbelly kind of characters and then obviously seven of nine just friggin murders all of them but there was something there and i, I liked that i liked what that was going towards well she's almost yeah more, she's i have to agree with you on that than, one um, yeah she's more Sorry. complex than the other two romulans um what are they called oh and Nerissa. Um, narissa narissa and narek she's almost more complex than them yeah i mean yeah yeah it, it's fascinating to see how a character like that thrives in the star trek universe and like i i don't know i i, I agree that would have been a more interesting uh thing to explore deeper if they'd had the time kind of thing because yeah she's a really fascinating character kind of you know harry mudd-esque from discovery uh but you know operating in this 24th century world right. Well, if they do a Seven of Nine spinoff, um, like, like I don't know, I think, is it fans pushing this? But um, if they do a Seven of Nine spinoff, I would, I would prefer that they place it in between Voyager and the first season of Picard, so that you can kind of see the transition or the change of Seven, and then you could see more of Bejazel. You could see more of how the relationship develops and how she interacted with her and her organization. I agree. You know, I, I think you would almost have yeah. to set it that way because if Seven's based off of the end of Picard season one, um, Seven is, you know, gallivanting around the cosmos with, you know, La Serena and the crew. Um, so, yeah, it would have to be when she was a Fenris Ranger, essentially, or maybe when she started that group or with the founding. And, yeah, that would be great. That'd be cool. Yeah, it'd be an interesting unexplored period and... and people who follow me know i'm I'm a big fan of the books now i just want to see a book set right in there and showing that transition that'd be really cool oh there'll be there'll be books oh sure. yeah i'm confident the <laughs> fenris ranger book series is absolutely being written oh, right yeah. now confident of that and yeah yeah 100 <laughs> they're gonna capitalize on that the baul 
I wanted to address the Baul before we leave with this this modern Star Trek. What do you guys think? Of, like, are the Baul still villains in your mind after we've seen um, the season two episode? Well, they're hmm. dead, aren't they? Are That's they dead? Question. They're destroyed, or I th- I don't know if they're wiped out completely by the Kelphians or not. The hope is that I, I think at the end of that episode that they'll be, you know, moving forward with this new cooperation kind of forced on them. So I think it ends on a hopeful note that they won't get wiped out. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I would say, well, beyond the, I'll say one thing about them is I've really enjoyed the, the creature design. I thought it was a mm. very modern take on the tar monster that we saw from TNG, even though I know they're not the same race, but obviously it was very much, you know, very similar to that. I like the creature design, even though the set that they sat it in was a weirdly redressed transporter room, and that was super obvious. But the creature itself, yeah. like <laughs> the creature, like the like the dripping and the hands and the way it talked and moved, and I thought that was really cool. So there's like, there was definitely some, somebody went a little, you know, a little, uh, you know, off the beaten path there and they went a little horror with that which i thought was kind of cool and i think that that's stuff like that is what modern trek is kind of missing and especially even from the villains perspective which is these kind of like creatures that are out there they're like this is like a really freakish thing like if you were to just see this thing in passing in a swamp you would you would freak out like if you saw the tar monster that killed tasha yard you'd be like what idiot fell in that tar pit and why is he standing there? Cause he just looks like a person wearing a tar suit, but this thing is terrifying. You know, it's really crazy looking. So yeah, I, I like the creature and I, I like the, are there what they were doing, but yeah, I would say that either they're wiped out or like you said, they're probably not really a, a villain anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to underscore your point about the look of the creature because I absolutely agree. I thought that was incredible and really well done uh, performance by uh, one of Doug Jones' frequent collaborators in horror films as well. Um, but I always had this theory that because they kept the Kelpians under control using fear and like the entire Kelpian way of life is based around fear at that time, that like he was appearing to them as something as terrifying as possible. And I always wondered if the Ba'ul were like actually these really diminutive, nebbish looking things that are really timid and not <laughs> just, frightening at just all. Just Ewoks, <laughs> just a bunch of Ewoks to jump out. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting <laughs> because considering they, they kind of established the, the Kelpians as essentially we learned that the Kelpians were prey. They were prey. They weren't the, oh, sorry, the Kelpians were the predators. They weren't the prey. Right. Um, you could almost imagine like the Ba'ul is kind of like a, a small fish type thing that lived in the water and that got fished or hunted by the by the Kelpians. And so, yeah, they, they have this technology to kind of change their appearance and appear scary like that. Like a, what is yeah, it? Yeah, that was always kind of, and I kind of kept waiting for them to, you know, reveal something like that. And I was kind of always sad they didn't. Almost like <laughs> a, um, like that thing from Harry Potter, where if you look at it, it just presents like the, your greatest fear essentially you never know what it looks oh. like a bogget or something like that whatever they're called right a yeah bo- the yeah yeah like something like that where yeah maybe you know because that would be interesting is is that's how they kind of started to get the upper hand eventually is they just started to appear or figured out how to manipulate their um you know their their sight of something and how they interacted with it and what they perceived yeah that'd be interesting that was an interesting idea i don't know maybe that'll come up in a book <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know if they're ever going to re- readdress the Kelpians uh, as a people. Or if they're just going to keep Saru and that's it. We've kind of seen his backstory, and now we're done with it. I hope not. I think you know not to get into a conversation about Discovery season three, but I would hope that the Kelpians survived and that we were going to see them kind of maybe like completely embedded in the Federation in some regards, or maybe they're all, or like you know what I mean, like whatever the post Federation or whatever these other alliances are in the quadrant maybe we'll see them running around and he maybe he tries to connect with them and they're like like i don't like you get the hell out of here that'd be kind of interesting yeah i'd love to see kind of where they are it it almost feels like in retrospect now a setup for that you know they changed the course of evolution for kaminar the two species on there so now we've jumped forward a thousand years i think it would be a wasted opportunity if we didn't see uh how that played out definitely Okay, so w- what I enjoy is is villains that aren't really villains, and you kind of address this with the crystalline entity because I, I I don't even know if the crystalline entity is like a a sentient being that's going around killing people just because he wants to kill people or just because it wants to kill people. 
It's more like it just needs the energy, right? right? Um, mm -hmm. So things like Macrocosm from Voyager, where, where you get those giant flying um, single-cell organisms. That the, kind of yeah, stuff. the huge mutated viruses <laughs> yeah. flying around. Those are the kind of stuff that I like because it's like way out there kind of sci-fi concepts. Right. And it's, it's, it's kind of, I like the idea of you're out there exploring space. You're not necessarily just going to meet uh, sentient beings, whether they're benevolent or not. You might, you know, whether they're ready to be friends or not, you might just meet something that's out there, like kind of like a xenomorph that's just out there to kill you. Yeah, kind of the idea of a force of nature versus somebody who's actively trying to be evil. And I I feel like that's kind of the original intent behind, you know, a quote unquote villain like the Borg, right? Q kind of describes them as such as, you know, the ultimate users. They're not interested in you or your politics. They're just consuming. They're just adding more to their collective and, and trying to uh, augment themselves. And you just happen to be in the way. You are raw material that they can use. They're not, they don't have an agenda, at least at that point in their creation. They're just uh doing what comes in quote marks i guess naturally <laughs> to them not really natural but you know no yeah i mean yeah that well, makes they, sense they, they undergo a change though when, when the Borg queen comes in they kind of like they kind of mm -hmm. pivot the way the, the the entire species functions i guess if absolutely call them yeah. a species yeah I, I think that that's uh i think the borg is a good example of that and it's also a good example to how the you know, both in universe and then on the in the writers' room, how that race kind of evolved over time from being kind of just an inst uh, like an unstoppable force that didn't really, like you said, like didn't really have like necessarily a agenda beyond just consumption and adapting and, and continuing to grow. And then later on, it kind of turned into something a little bit more. I don't want to say sinister, but with a bit more focus, I guess, if you could say. Like, it was still not necessarily caring about politics. It was still just about consuming, but they obviously gave it more of a face and much more of a personality and stuff like that later on in Star Trek's franchise's history. But, yeah, I, I like the idea of, of just beings out there that are beyond really kind of comprehension, but, like, they're just, like, yeah, like, they're just dangerous. Like, they're necessarily, like, not even necessarily villains. Like, it reminds me of the... Uh, the older guy who god i don't even remember what race he killed the the you guys know what i'm talking about he, oh the uh from the season three uh the survivors i think it was the survivors where his wife was actually dead but he made her appear as though she was alive oh yeah yeah There's like kevin, one plot of kevin land right right planet. and he killed an entire race of people with a thought you know and it's like Mm -hmm. Is he a mass murderer? Absolutely. Is he a villain? Well, gosh, I don't know. You know, he was self-defense and he was in anguish and he was upset. And it's like, so, but there's just be like beings like that are, I think, so cool because it's like, that's the stuff you're, you know, that I imagine we would find out there in deep space where it's just things that we can't even, like even Picard from the episode, he's like, I don't even have a law to charge you with the crime that you committed because this is literally so far beyond us. Uh, just please go to your planet and don't think about killing anybody in the Federation because I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> but it's just stuff like that, you know, like he's, he's not necessarily a villain, but th beings like that, I think are so cool. I think they're really cool. Mm -hmm. That's uh, I, I, not to steer it away from Star Trek, but I'm immediately thinking of Babylon five where they talk about these aliens that just kind of appear this, in space, this big, huge thing. And the guy, uh, likens them to like he picks up an ant and puts the ant back down and says you know what do you what do you think the ant thought of that it's like what just happened how would you explain that that's how far above those guys are above us and and we have no idea we're just try not to get stepped on right i just Babylon, love that. Babylon 5 did a really good job at dealing with those kind of like really um grandiose concepts like that because mm -hmm. even what what are they called um like the the fifth race the the ones that don't speak and always oh the the Vorlons or yeah the Vorlons yeah. even them they're they're freaking weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah I couldn't even tell you if they're villains or not exactly yeah the Davidians what do you guys think of them the Davidians Ooh. um I haven't thought of yeah, them I gotta in bring ages. Up a picture here of what those guys look like again 
Oh, they're those yeah, blue, so... shiny guys. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. They, the... they exist kind of out of phase with us, and they time travel back in time to steal, uh, like, life energy, I guess, from dying people, basically. Yeah, the Davidians. Mm. I remember these guys now. I'm looking at them from Star Trek Online, mostly, because there's, like... They kind of exist out of phase uh, from us. That captured my imagination as a kid as well. The fact that, uh, like, different entities could live in the same place as us, but just in a different time or a different well, phase. Well, that reminds me, too, of what were those aliens that were taking people off the Enterprise and then cutting their limbs off? Oh, yeah. Um, from schisms in Season yes. 6. I don't think... Do we ever find out what race mm-hmm. those aliens were? But they were from, like, an alternate sub-parallel universe or whatever, but they were able to probe into our space time and then pull people out and they were doing experiments and then sending them back like i don't know were those villains necessarily kind of seemed like it because they were kind of being rather nefarious <laughs> but uh, they, were just, they were just they were just scientists right they were just doing experiments you know but yeah like beings like that like it's so <laughs> cool you know like and that's that's like cool stuff that we need more of um and i i yeah those those kinds of creatures and beings and races are so cool to, to kind of explore and, and to make kind of ambiguous villains out of, really. Because, again, like, the Davidians, are they really bad? Or are they do they need this energy in order to survive? And it's like, well, then at what point do you cross the line, kind of with the crystalline entity? Like, where where's the line here where it's like, you have a right to exist, we have a right to exist, but your existence is now infringing on our ability to even be alive. So it's like, where, where's where's the line, you know? So... There's, you know, and then it is destroying the Davidians or even the crystal entity. Does that make us as humans the villains? I don't know. They certainly charged that doctor lady Mm -hmm. with uh, a crime. It looked like at the end of the episode, she was going to get charged with some kind of a crime, or at least they were going to try to. So is she a villain now? I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Like, if you think back, you know, millions of years living on, you know, the savannah, you know, we'd be hunted and killed by lions. We wouldn't consider the lions a villain necessarily. And then now you just come forward in time and we're going into space and encountering new predators that they're just feeding. Are they villains? That, that's a really interesting question. Right. right. We, yeah, like that's like, yeah, like that's a good example. Like with the, with the lions from back in the day, like what were the humans, how did they perceive the lion or the saber tooth tiger or whatever it was that was hunting them like did they perceive them as they perceived them as dangerous but did they perceive them necessarily as villains obviously they probably didn't even have a word for it back then because this is a long time ago but it you know it's it's yeah these are really great questions to kind of ask oneself especially when you're dealing with higher levels of thought that we're at now and that we would have when we were space traveling in star trek like how would you approach that topic and i think a lot of people kind of because, I, you know, like Picard's approach to the crystalline entity was that it wasn't a villain. But then you flip that and look at the TOS episode where Kirk was going up against that cloud that was eating people. And it was mm-hmm. like he treated it immediately like a villain. Like it was a villain no matter what. It, and, and that's the way it was played in the episode. And to Kirk, it was a villain. And that was his, you know, he was Ahab and that was the white whale. And he wanted to get that thing. And the episode frames it as though the cloud is a villain, but is it though? You know, does it require the salt? I think it was the salt of the people's body or whatever it was consuming. Like, does that make it a villain? I don't know. But the episode certainly made you think it was. Mm-hmm. Ethically, and he got blowed up oh, real yeah, good. He blew, he blew the <laughs> hell out of that thing. Oh yeah. Ethically speaking, it's it's strange because like if you if you were to take. Um, the the universe of the galaxy as it is and so the federation has expanded and all of these races all of these different species they live in harmony but then you have these oddities you have these strange things like the davidians or you know whatever race that they they kind of need to consume um the life force or the energy they need to kill other people it's like at what point can you kind of establish all right we we're going to kill you and get rid of you because you're disrupting our kind of perfect world that we've created like all of these thousands of millions of races have come together we're all living in harmony but you guys can't do that because you guys have to kill us in order to survive right. it's like are you are you ethically allowed to kind of get rid of that one single race or do you have to find a way to sacrifice the old i don't know um hmm. 
Yeah, it's it's a tough it's a tough question. Yeah. I'm glad we're not in space because I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, it's it's a definitely a tough one, and it's one I th- I feel like in some form or another we've been wrestling with for our entire existence and will continue to, you know, like the international actor who, you know, some dictator who's not playing by the rules, you know, when is intervention justified, you know, when it, when it could kill civilians as well and all that kind of stuff, you know, when, when can you step in? When can you say you're wrong? I'm right. And we need to do something about this. Yeah. Mm. It's it's quite interesting. It's uh, yeah. It's it's a, it's a tough question to to really ask and and to really get an answer. I mean, obviously, you want it, the immediate answer is obviously just well, whatever doesn't whatever doesn't hurt life, you know, whatever's pro saving lives. But sometimes it's not that easy. Like with the Davidians or with the crystalline entity, it's not that simple because they survive off of that, you know. And it's like okay, well then, you know, and not to get into this kind of debate, but it's like okay, well humans, you know, consume animals they don't necessarily sentient beings but it's it's a simpler like you made the analogy earlier about the uh, the babylon 5 race with the ant you know and it's like to the crystalline entity we're not anything more than that so it's like do we mm-hmm. say no oh we totally are i'm showing you and the crystalline entity's like i don't even like it didn't even understand that we were trying to talk to it until we had the weird harmonic resonance thing and then it maybe thought we were trying to talk to it but then that totally didn't work out because we blew it up with that but you know what i mean though it's like before that they were trying to hail it and talk to it like normal but it just wasn't even registering that we were even attempting to talk to it it wasn't even picking it up it didn't even understand that we were trying to talk to it because in that in that being's mind it was just nothing it was just noise it was space mm-hmm. noise it was nothing so yeah it's it is interesting it is a very uh yeah it's not a, it's not an easy topic to get through for sure I don't know if this is how you thought this conversation was going to go, Sean, but this is where we're at now. <laughs> well, you know, to- topics tend to... I-, I have like a baseline topic and then if we just talk about anything, it's fine. Um, try to keep it on track a bit, but whatever. I mean, v- villains in Star Trek are very varied, so y- you're bound to go in any direction. A good villain that I would say that actually is like a more traditional style um, villain that I really just enjoyed watching every time they were on screen was the Dura Sisters. Hmm. They were yeah. great. Yeah. I they were both had a lot of personality. They were always up to no good. They were always mis, you know kind of doing like a little scheme. They were always running some kind of game and I think one of the biggest missteps of generations was killing them both. Um maybe just killing one of them or something, but yeah, that that was I always loved like when I was watching TNG as a kid, like I always I mean, obviously I loved watching them on screen and then their characters themselves were really fascinating because they were always up to no good. And I like them a lot. They were pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I like the idea of that. I don't know how to put it exactly, but you know, we have our Federation people who are always so moral and upstanding and that sort of thing. So to juxtapose them with these two scheming uh, people who are you know trying to take over the Klingon Empire or make trilithium weapons or whatever, like it was just always a lot of fun. <laughs> Tell me everything you know about trilithium. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's. What was interesting, too, with the Duras is, is other than Generations, where it was purely like it was just about a revenge plot um, against the, the, the Enterprise because the Enterprise had screwed with their plans so much. But really what they were doing internally to the Empire wasn't even, from the Klingon's perspective, wasn't even wrong. Like they were doing normal Klingon activity of trying to take over the Empire. Like that was a very common thing and it seemed very natural for the warrior race to have those kinds of occurrences but the way it was presented obviously from the viewer's perspective which is the federation's perspective is they were the schemers and they were the antagonists and they were the villains but again like it's an extra layer of it's like we're viewing it as it's wrong and they're doing the wrong things and they're liars and they're terrible people but at the same time though they're in a culture that is kind of built on that in a lot of ways where it's not like what they're doing isn't necessarily wrong. Like Worf is like a huge caricature of the warrior honor and all that stuff like that. But how many Klingons characters have we dealt with that were clearly not that way? Almost all of them are not Mm -hmm. that way. They're all very, very, even Worf's brother wasn't like that way. Like, so it was Worf Worf tries to embody what he thinks a Klingon should be. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. 
Worf is, Worf is totally the born again. <laughs> yeah, he he read you about know. the Klingon what Klingons were in the pamphlet. He was like, warrior race, highly honorable. Got it. That's that's it. I'm that's all it. in. That's all there yes. is. Prune right, juice. prune juice. Right, growing up in Poland. Those are all the things that I know about being a Klingon. And <laughs> right, right. And then, but then when you look at the other Klingons, like they're all scheming. They're all like backstabbing. They're all like not necessarily like full on like Romulans are, but they're always like trying to find an, a way to kind of, you know, to get ahead. The Duras family, uh, I think the, the, the issue comes with the fact that they kind of, they, they're they constantly dealing with um, Romulans, right? Right, mm -hmm. that's true. They, they're, not, they're not doing the internal kind of um, Klingon power move, I guess. They, 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 they're scheming with enemies of the Empire. Right. But, I mean, yeah. there's even precedence there, too, because if I remember in TOS, there was an exchange of technology between the Romulans and the Klingons. Um, so... You know, there is there's precedence there. You know, again, it's just it's just like their culture, the way it's presented to the viewer is their savage warrior race and their and the Duras is there's like a very large caricature of that concept. And even though I really love them as villains, but at the same time, like I said, like there's still precedence within the Empire for their actions in a lot of ways for what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And f and from their perspective, you know, Gowron and his group were conspiring with those gross Federation types, Well, right. Too, Gowron so. basically leaned entirely mm. on the arbiter of his succession, Jean-Luc Picard. You know, they, they were completely reliant on that, even all the way through Deep Space Nine, too. Like, even though there was a lot of back and forth there with the alliances and stuff like that with the Klingons. But there, there was a lot of reliance on the Federation for that, for sure. Okay, we have to, we have to address Khan, right? We have to talk about Khan. <laughs> Wait, which are you talking um, about Benedict Cumberbatch Khan, or which Khan are you referring to? Well, I'm talking about Prime Khan. We can talk about we can talk about Kelvin Khan okay. if you want. Um, I, I feel like they're completely different characters. They're just completely different people, right? Um, but Prime Khan is someone that I've always felt is a bit underwhelming. I think he's very interesting in the episode, but then like, uh, well, maybe because I'm not the biggest fan of the Wrath of Khan the movie, but I feel like it's kind of he's kind of um, uh overhype as a star trek villain he's he's i don't know he embodies star trek villains he's like the the darth vader of star trek but when you when you watch the episode in the movie kind of not you know yeah with khan i i feel like he's he is very one note in the wrath of khan and and the thing that's so memorable about him to my mind is he's played so well by ricardo Mont montalban that you know it I, I love that film and I love Khan in that movie. The legacy of that that kills me is how many times they try to copy it without really getting why that worked for that movie and why it might not necessarily work for other stories as well. So I feel like the legacy of Khan is kind of damaging to Star Trek a little bit because every time they rolled out a new movie they seem to be saying like oh we've got the next con you know we've got uh shinzon in star trek nemesis he's totally the next con nero in this he's totally a con like villain until they finally just did con again and i'm like that's not the way to go guys Stop well it. i mean you're preaching to the <laughs> choir i did a three-part video series on how con damaged the uh the the star trek film universe yeah, oh, that's I, right. Yeah, we had we had pseudo cons in Enterprise as well. Well, yeah, we had little baby cons in, in Enterprise, little tiny baby cons, <laughs> cons. conlings. Yeah, the con. Oh, I'm not going to say that word. Anyways, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I. So I know Sean, you and I diff differ on this. I think Khan is a great villain. I thought that the way that it was brought up inside of the wrath of Khan from his appearance inside of, I don't think the rivalry between Kirk and Khan was a thing in my personal opinion was a thing before the wrath of Khan. I think Kirk mm -hmm. at that, at, by the end of the original series, Kirk had bested many villains, you know, he was all over the place taking care of business, you know, and the strong rivalry between the two of them, I don't think... It was more with the Klingons. Right, it was a lot with the Klingons, and they played that up later on in the movies too, obviously, with his son being killed by Klingons and stuff. And I don't think it was really that prevalent until the movie came out, and then they really ramped it up. But what was really great about that was 
they did it very smartly where the the ramp up of the quote unquote rivalry was really on Khan's end because he felt like Kirk abandoned them on the planet, his wife died, and everything went to shit like just shortly right after the Enterprise left them there. And so he blamed Kirk for that, which then blinded him from the rest of his mission, which is what his I don't know if that was his son or whoever the hell that blonde guy was that was trying to tell him to let the revenge mission go and to just leave and he wouldn't let it go because he was so consumed with that revenge. Um I I think that it was a great great character, well acted, and and what's interesting, and you guys brought it up, and I've talked about it a lot in my three-part series, which is now everybody wants to recapture that, but you can't quite capture it because what was fun about it was that it was connected back to a pretty good um, episode of the original series, but it was just kind of tucked in there. And it was just kind of like, oh my gosh, they really brought him back for this. This is really interesting. And they never did that other than like they brought the Dura sisters into generations but again like they were cartoon characters essentially and then they got blowed up immediately because they were on that old friggin bird of prey but they it was like the connections back to the original series show and how it fit in with the narrative of the genesis device and everything else that was going on with kirk as a character not so much about the revenge between the two of them and the rivalry excuse me between the two of them the way it was kind of pushed in there, I thought was really well done, which I think elevated his villain status in the fandom to where it's at now, because it was just a great piece of that very large puzzle of that movie, even though it's called The Wrath of Khan. But he was a very large piece of a very big puzzle for that film. And they continuously tried to recapture films based off of that specific puzzle piece without realizing that, again, he was just one piece of a large puzzle, but they keep making films about just the puzzle piece and not the rest of it and it just kind of falls by the wayside i think they did the best they could with nemesis but ultimately that movie failed miserably with what it was trying to do and kelvin khan was pretty terrible (laughs) yeah i i can't disagree with anything you said there absolutely uh i think you hit hit the nail on the head with regards to my feelings about khan as well I think maybe what bugs me is that I, I feel like we haven't seen Khan at his full capacity. Because in the episode, he just, he's, he's kind of waking up and he's getting used to this new um, time period in which he's living. And then in the movie, um, it's all about, you know, he has to get off this planet and he's trying to understand what's going on. He just wants revenge. I, I, would, I would almost enjoy um, like a short, a short miniseries about... Um, the eugenics wars? I don't know, like... Not necessarily. I would enjoy that, though. That would be for that. That would be the first time Star Trek actually made a show in the past. Um, n- not in the past of the future, but like in the past, it would be like a, a show based in the nineties, right? Right. Right. Um, so I don't know how people would feel about that. Um, but I, I feel like you could almost make a story about uh, what happened to Khan when he was on the planet, um, and do like a maybe retcon the fact that he was on the planet. For the entire duration, um, you could say that like Klingons or someone or Roman and someone came because they knew he was there. They kind of picked him up, and they were, they, they were like, "Oh, we're going to use him uh, in whatever plot, whatever ploy to attack, you know, Federation or whatever." Um, and they try to use him, but then the whole movie revolves around the fact that Khan is much more intelligent than them, and they're absolutely unable to um, use them or the, uh, yeah, use him. And eventually, at the end of the movie, they just put him back. They plop him back on the planet. Um, <laughs> you could also use that to explain how he, he he knows Chekhov and how he gets the little Starfleet pendant or something. But I I feel we haven't seen him at his full potential. Hmm. I almost feel like the original kind of brief at the end of the episode Space Seed would have been really interesting, right? Like kind of what the episode title is based on, where Kirk says it would be interesting to come back here in a hundred years and see what has come of this seed that's been planted here. Like what kind of a civilization would Khan and his followers have created if they'd have been, (laughs) yeah, if they'd have been allowed to, uh, you know, if, you know, SETI Alpha 6 hadn't exploded inexplicably and (laughs) screwed everything up. This is SETI Alpha 5! Yeah. Yeah. What's the matter, Reliant? You guys can't count planets? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's not get into that. Let's not sucks. get into that. Yeah, the science, the science <laughs> ship with the science team didn't realize one of the planets was missing. Yeah, let's not get into that. 
Well, Uhura, the communications officer, sometimes doesn't know how to speak Klingon. So. Oh, yeah, well, the book, the That's book fine. of Klingon. Yeah. Toot, fat, foot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where did she even get that book from? Where did she get the book? The physical book. Where did she get that? Anyways. Oh, I love Star Trek VI, but that scene is is mind-bogglingly i i don't yeah. understand one of the greatest <laughs> she's been a communications officer for 45 years and she never learned how to speak klingon yeah that's where she got the book she got the book at her academy training yes <laughs> that's it it's it's this really outdated uh, old klingon dictionary it's not even you a know, dictionary it's like one of those um tourist books where you've got those sentences that are already what made. you will about the kelvin movies at least they bothered to make it so that uhura and the kelvin universe bothered to learn friggin klingon the the biggest enemy yeah, of the she, federation she even knows multiple dialects well that's I think. true all three dialects i think is what it's what she said something like that yeah mm. she's a ling- linguistics genius in the kelvin universe i guess uhura in the prime universe did a little too much party and at the starfleet academy didn't want to study up on her, on her on her klingon that's okay too much alcohol in the prime time. <laughs> That's line. true. She had a couple too many Cardassian sunrises. Don't ask me how they knew about that. Let's not get into that. Oh, we should probably. Oh, I just realized it's all explained in canon because she, her entire memory is wiped by Nomad in the episode The Changeling. So. That didn't happen in the Kelvin timeline. Oh, so. what a wow! That's it. There it is. Wow. Saved. There yeah. it is. We figured uh, it out. <laughs> she definitely didn't bother to learn it again. <laughs> yeah. I guess not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on. Once you've learned it once, you don't need to learn it again. It's, that, it's that's true. There's too many dialects. Yeah. Um, do, do you guys feel like we need villains in Star Trek stories? Because I feel like Star Trek is one of one of the rare franchises where you don't actually need a villain. You take, like, in any Avengers movie, like, any superhero type thing, you need a villain in a superhero movie, but Star Trek often does without them entirely. There's, like, a planet in Voyager where time passes differently. There's no villain in that. It's just, like, a, a sci-fi concept, and uh, it shows the crew dealing with that. I, and I think it's one of the only franchises that I would say that. for a movie, my answer would be yes. I would think that you need one. Not necessarily for a show, but for a film with what you know modern audience uh film right now i don't think you would be able to construct it without a proper villain and it doesn't need to be i think what they're missing right now is like the character um i don't crawl or whatever the hell his name was from star trek beyond played by idris elba was Mm. a character Mm. that i think they should have spent more time instead of making him like a cartoon caricature of like somebody who was essentially irredeemable i think we should have spent more time trying to deal with a redemption arc of him and his crew after they felt abandoned by the federation and their minds were warped and then he slowly started to turn back into his character at the end there i feel like that would have been like one of those kind of ambiguous villains that we could have probably got time to know and and you know maybe not necessarily like a straight up like mean evil character trying to take over the universe or blow the universe up but Somebody like that is, I think, potentially a little bit more interesting. But that's still a, it's still a villain, but maybe they could do a bit more with it. I feel like we didn't need his makeup. I think we could have gotten rid of, like, the Kral makeup entirely and just dealt with what's he called, Thomas Edison. Um, just dealt with him. Because, like, everyone knew it was Idris Elba anyway. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. r- revealing his face. Like, we, we know what he looks like. So I think we could have... If they had done that, maybe they could have dealt with the, yeah, how the character dealt with um, his departure from Starfleet and how he felt abandoned by Starfleet more than what they yeah. did. Yeah. To, to your question, too, uh, does Star Trek need a villain? I feel like Star Trek, more than anything, is a setting for all kinds of really interesting stories and certainly for some of those stories no villain is needed at all like you you mentioned the voyager episode blink of an eye great example star trek for the voyage home there's there's a force there's kind of an antagonist but not really not there's no real villain and i think those kinds of stories you can tell within the star trek universe but there are also stories in the star trek universe that have made really good use of villains uh, I'm thinking like Gul Dukat's arc on Deep Space True. Nine. Yeah. 
Mm. I, I, I think he's an incredible villain, and I think that's a really Kai interesting Wynn. story to tell. Kai Wynn, yeah. absolutely. Another great villain. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, that's a... Yeah, I mean, that's what, like, in a sh- in, from a television show's perspective, those characters, I think, are perfectly capable of shining through. And then, you all, like, some of the great episodes, like, that stand out to me don't have villains associated with them, you know, and, or necessarily, like, there's just a conflict. It doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily, like, a villain. Like, there's, um, like, there's a, there's a couple of really great episodes that just deal with, like, either, like, a plague or, like, a treaty or you guys can't stay here anymore or this planet needs to be evacuated or the exocomps, you know, they're dying and they're sentient beings, you know, mm-hmm. like there's mm-hmm. a conflict here. It's not necessarily like a villain, but again, like Dr. Crusher lives in her own, uh, universe. Bubble. Well, that's yeah. I mean, and she also has sex with another <laughs> yeah. ghost, but it's, it's, <laughs> that's the villain of Star Trek. That Ugh, episode. God, it actually yeah. it is, but yeah, that's <laughs> something I don't really want to talk about that episode, but, it's it's i think from a movie's perspective nowadays from a general audience's perspective to get people in the seats to get people to enjoy it it has to be a bit more of a spectacle which requires a villain like somebody for the for the the audience to clearly root for and against and part of that is because of the standard that was set up through the success of 10 years of Marvel movies where people go to the movies now and they want it to be relatively clear, like who are the bad guys, who are the good guys and what are the stakes? And if you have a giant floating cigar making really bad waves (laughs) on the planet, people are going to be like, what? I mean, it was even like at the time, you know, like people were still like, that's a really weird movie about the whales. But like, that's one of the, like, I love that movie. Like I was like, that's, that's, that's a great film. But right, like if you just have a giant floating cigar that doesn't have a face, it doesn't talk, it just screeches and talks in whale tones, I don't think it's going to work. It's just not going to work for a modern audience. Yeah, I hmm, I hate to agree with that, <laughs> but I, I think, I, I, think I might have to. You're talking about movies. I agree. I think we can we like if we could shift away the kind of big villain villain end of the galaxy kind of style away from the TV shows. Yeah. And maybe keep that for the movies, that would be okay. It's like, it's a movie, so you make it an event out of it. So you Mm -hmm. have a big villain, and it's stakes are high, you got to stop them, that's okay. And then the TV shows, we can go back to kind of what we were dealing with before. I agree. I agree with that. And I think that's something that, because you had the movie team, including Alex Kurtzman and company, coming off of the movies that were doing the grandiose villain stories, they translated that into the small screen. And I think that's like we all talked about, like that's an exhausting concept to do repetitively because it's just you it, you lose that sense of urgency because it's like how how many of these adventures can these hundred people go on before they all just freak the hell out? Like these are these are crazy adventures. Like even the first season of Discovery, like if I was a member of the Discovery and I went through all the crazy stuff that happened in the first season, I'd be like, yo, I need a break. I need to go on R and R, but they didn't even go on R and R. Pike showed up immediately, <laughs> and they immediately went and dealt with this the the red the red giant situation or the red angel situation. You know, I don't even have holidays. Yeah, oh. right, right. I don't think. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. You're not, you're not putting me in a holodeck to get pregnant with some <laughs> chick that I put my feet in the sand with, like I'm Commander Tucker. It's not gonna work. Oh, there we go. <laughs> It's kind of funny, like something like the short treks kind of almost gave me a bit of hope. Uh, you know, you get a story like Calypso, which, you know, is just kind of this nice story. It's open ended. Uh, there's no it's not leading from one episode into another, at least not yet. And there's no villain. It's just the story of this guy falling in love with this AI and vice versa you know, that really struck me as like a classic Star Trek story. And I was kind of like, you know, we get it, we're getting this in the short treks. Maybe we'll see more of that carried through. And I'm actually really hopeful with regards to, and you mentioned earlier, Strange New Worlds, that that might be an arena where we get more of that kind of story, at least occasionally. Well, I think just based off of the announcement um, that the line that Anson Mount said at the end, that it's going to be more classic star trek i think the intent there is not just in tone but also in styles and mm-hmm. they have come out and said that it's going to be much more episodic i think akiva's goldsman's come out and i think michelle paradis and um 
a few of the other ones whose names I'm forgetting came out and said that it's going to be much more episodic um, as opposed to like Discovery, which was a much more of an epic where Discover- or did Picard toned it down, but it was still like the last couple of episodes were definitely trying to ramp it back up again to the universe ending, you know, crazy concept of the centipede and stuff like that. They did the right thing by not having this giant battle at the end by just having it be the characters, even though I thought the ending was terrible, but they did the right thing by not having the big battle and by skipping it. They did Agreed the right thing on there. that. Point, so yeah. I think they're learning. I think that it's a process and I'm hoping I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll see maybe though, if anything, they'll just regulate the universe ending stuff, to discovery, and then that'll just be the exhausting adventures that the discovery goes on. And then the rest of us will watch the other shows and kind of get that more kind of Star Trek self-contained uh, episodes. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, all right. Uh, it's been almost an hour, so I think uh, I'm going to let you guys go. I'm, go- I'm going to ask a final question, and I might be, again, the only one that thinks this, but d- do you guys think that Species 8472 deserves a, uh, a big screen appearance? Like, d- do they deserve to be in a movie at some point? Hmm. I, you know, I feel like if I'd have just watched Scorpion and nothing else after that yet, I would say yes. I, I really feel like they got defanged in the episode in the flesh, uh, which, you know, they took human form and, and were planning to infiltrate Starfleet and it ended up kind of being a negotiation with them across a briefing room table, which, you know, is very Star Trek. It's very nice, very pat, but like, I don't know, they didn't seem like the same species that uh, Kess was saying, you know, the weak shall perish is how they operate. The, the, the ones that do uh, piles of mangled Borg bodies. Yeah, yeah, they did not seem like the same uh, characters, same race there, so I would say at this point, no, maybe maybe something similar, like a similar concept but just redo it from the ground up or something. But mm. uh, I was really, I can you tell I was really disappointed in that It's episode. coming through, yes, we're yeah. getting that. <laughs> 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 I, I would say no, um, but not for the same reasons. I would just say that if we're talking about a film, um, I think that they're too strange to just introduce in a self-contained two-hour movie. Um I don't think general audience members are familiar enough with the race. Whereas like people know who the Romulans are. People know who the Klingons are. People know who the Federation is. You could probably get away with like a film about the Cardassians or something like that, or the Dominion. You could probably get away with that just because of, I think over time their popularity has also grown, but 8472 would be like, as if you made a movie about the Iconians and it's like, yeah, there might be some really cool stories there, but I think it would be very difficult to get them out in a two-hour movie. Maybe if they did like a trilogy for 8472 or a trilogy for Iconians where it was building up to this grand reveal and it was like a like a whole thing and it was carefully crafted and, and worked throughout a three-movie arc or something like that, then I think it would work. But for like a standalone film, I think it would just be too strange, too weird for, for a movie audience. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, three movies is like a long-term investment, um, and we don't even know how many how many such movies we're going to get. Well, now. listen, there are green light and series is left and right, so I'm sure we'll get some movies here shortly. <laughs> they're they're dropping millions yeah. of dollars on these. I mean, I understand that a budget for a film is obviously way higher than for a television show, but they're they're green light and things left and right. So we'll we'll see what we get. Well, you'd be surprised. Deadpool one cost ninety million, and that's pretty much how much uh, like one season of Discovery costs, isn't it? Uh, even even Picard hmm. actually Discovery is a little bit higher, but yeah, the Picard budget was around that yeah. was around that park. Yeah, so. But. And I'm part of the people that, that that says like the less money you throw at Star Trek, the better it comes out. Anyway, so. Yeah, I mean, how about like a three or four part miniseries on, mm. uh, released on CBS All Access or something? I think that would that's a model that, I I if I were them, I don't know anything about television production, but I'd be really interested in looking into something yeah. like that little anthology series with like little kind of vignettes Mm -hmm. yeah i mean they should they should i think what we're talking about really is taking the short track concept and making it so that they're not so short they're not seven minutes long they're a little bit 
beefier and there's a little bit more yeah. there um yeah that would be interesting i'd be totally down for that yeah i think that that's the vehicle is already exists they should just throw a couple of more dollars and cents at it and let them tell some more interesting stories like even a a, a con mini series like you were talking about earlier where he's at the height of his prime and we get to see some of that or something like that or flashback to the eugenics wards or even world war three or something like that that'd be kind of interesting and how it all ties together. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Maybe what what was Cochrane up to before World War Three? You know, something like that. What was he doing? How did how did he go from first contact to uh, the original series? Con, uh, Cochrane? Right, right. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> they sobered him up. They sent him to to rehab. Is what they did. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you guys so much for being here, everyone. You can check out uh, Coach Ratch's channel and uh, Kit Wolski's channel. You guys know who they are. Uh, I'm assuming. Um, any final statements about about the villains of Star Trek? Uh, none for me. I'll just say thank you so much for, for having me on. I really appreciate the discussion, and, and thanks for bringing me on again. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that as well. Thanks for inviting me on. It was a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this discussion. I thought it was great fun. All right, cool. Thank you guys so much for coming, and uh, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Live long and prosper.